Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with George Zamanillo, Director of History Miami, and Stuart Chase, President and CEO of History Miami. They have both generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. I'd like to thank you both for joining us today. It's our pleasure. Thank Glad you. to be here. So you run the premier institution that exposes the history of this very fascinating region and this very fascinating city. Talk about the museum and its place within the museum ecosystem of Miami and, and Florida. Yeah, the, quite simply, the best way to put it is that we tell Miami stories. We tell the stories of South Florida, the greater region, and we share with the community and our visitors from around the globe. There's a deep history here. Uh, most don't think there is, but there's a deep history here in Miami. Uh, and George has carried actually many of those exhibitions in the past. But we have a fabulous opportunity to share the stories of Miami with our visitors. And this is really a place of cross-cultural intersection from, its early, from the earliest times in which you had settlers moving in, you have native peoples here, and then you have this, these waves of immigration that come from all over the world. How do you actually make sense of something that, is, that really did not unfold in, in, in a sequential way? Well, it's one of the great opportunities we have. It's also a challenge. Miami is very diverse. <clears throat> South Florida is over three quarters uh, foreign born or else born outside Miami, 65% uh, uh, Hispanic. You know, everybody in South Florida is from somewhere else. We do not have any indigenous tribes here. So even the Seminole and Miccosukee Indians that are here today came from, came from the Creek region. Uh, the ones that were here 10,000 years ago migrated down to South Florida looking for large game. You know, so it's always people coming from South Florida or from somewhere else, and that continues till today the large immigration base. So it's a challenge to reach those markets and those communities. Uh, but we feel we have a great uh, combination of exhibitions that tell the local story and also the national story at a local level. And in terms of the audience, how has the audience developed since, since you came in, Stuart? What have you evolved uh, with your team since? I tried to absorb what was going on and I right away knew that design um, and the freshness of new things was really what Miami is all about. And so when you have a history museum, you can't take that and be static and flat and dull and lifeless. You have to invigorate it. The, the museum had always done this, had done a very good job at it, uh, reaching out to various communities to network with them, to work with them. Uh, the first example I have was when we did the Bob Marley exhibition, we reached out to the Jamaican community and really wanted to understand what they thought about Bob Marley, how we could serve them. Many people say, why Bob Marley in Miami? Well, they don't realize maybe that he lived here in Miami. And this is where he passed away at the end of his life. And when I thought about the lyrics, I thought, I took my art background and said, Barbara Kruger, huge artworks with huge words. And that's exactly what we did. And it made a huge transition with the institution because they could see the opportunities. We literally wrapped words down the wall, on the floor, and up the other wall. But all the great material was there, uh, sound, listening, but focused on the lyrics, and the lyrics are fantastic. Plus, Marley's lyrics are, are, are very political. You, you all of a sudden incite people to participate in that dialogue. Absolutely, and so one of the things that we have a challenge with at History Miami Museum is investment in a huge uh, community, getting connected with them, the, knowing the need to maintain those relationships, mm -hmm. but when you change the next exhibition is a completely different subject, how do you get those people that you engage with to continue on the path? Well, how do you, you get the Cuban community to come to the exhibition that you're engaging a different uh, group? The Pedro Pan exhibition we did that we closed last year uh, was a great success. This told the story of mm -hmm. over 14,000 kids that came over in Cuba from 1960 to 62, right. arrived in Miami without parents, unaccompanied. Largest exodus in the Western Hemisphere. Very personal connection, though. It was really about their story. We interviewed them. They were telling their story, navigating the exhibit. Um, the conclusion was about the way they felt, what, what they're doing today, how they've made it in the United States for the past 40 years. So it's very personal. So then you remove that group from the museum, and what are they going to come back to see? Right. Luckily, they, they got to appreciate the quality of the exhibition, what we offered, uh, became members, um, and were invested. We had guest curators that were, Pedro Pan, part of the exodus. So that helped a great deal. Uh, and they do return. Some of those people do return. Now, I think one of the opportunities we have is, is we have more than one space we can use. We have two or three shows at a time. That does help. Because you go to the museum, there might be an architecture show, a sports show at the same time, and then your interests are, are peaked. 
One of the things that we have here going for us in Miami is we call them 305ers. It's our area code, 305. And these are usually young, not always, young professional people who are really invested and interested in Miami. We can almost call them hipsters. Yeah. There are some hipsters thrown so the in. Miami, so the Miami version of hipsters. Yeah, and so I throw, sort of throw in, you know, hipsters get maligned in some ways, but I actually think here in Miami, they're helping to save a lot of the culture and, and growing interest in what Miami's all about. And they're the next generation of philanthropists. A good example is many of them ask for money, <clears> Kickstarter, <throat> or to fund their campaign, or to fund their new mm -hmm. business. So they already had that kind of social giving in mind, and yeah. they want to give back eventually. But those, those 20 and 30 year olds, right. I have great hope in that. And that's one of the audiences that we're focused on yeah. marketing ourselves to. So oh, there's a real business marketing challenge. You are engaged in a competition for attention. And you're Absolutely. engaged in that competition with movie theaters, with every live music performer, with every other museum. How do you approach that? We do depend a lot on social media. Miami is particularly focused on social media, particularly for events, because this is an event-driven city. Right. Everything in Miami is an event. And if that event isn't crisp and sharp and fun and all those things, um, out of sight, out of mind. Right. So when you're putting together your exhibitions, you're also thinking about social media and outreach and how do you... Oh, definitely. Do you... I like calling it the, the selfie moment, right? You look at people. So you so you're doing yeah. this. I think oh, my 18 year old daughter. What does she do when she goes somewhere? And the first thing they do is find a good place to take a photo. Yeah. And I, and I, I really look at exhibits that way. We want to make sure we, we communicate with the message, but at the same time we have a great exhibit designer that makes it artistically very engaging. And you turn the corner and there's always an opportunity. Mm -hmm. The Bob Marley exhibit is a perfect example. Years ago, with those large lyrics, and guess what? The first thing people did was pose in front of the lyrics, and, and take a selfie. Oh, that's very interesting. So and that that gets hashtagged and put on social media immediately. Everybody knows we have a Marley exhibit. Now, you are an affiliate of the Smithsonian Institution, uh, Institution of Learning and National Heritage. You, on the other hand, are focused on revealing the heritage of Miami. How does that relationship work? We not only share their expertise, but they also reach out to us yeah. for projects they're working on. Right now, we're working on a project called Cuban Voices, where they're looking into how they tell the Cuban diaspora story not only in Miami, but in LA and DC. The, the Cuban diaspora stories, right? Stories, and, and, exactly. and evolving stories as, you know, with Castro dying, the, the whole question of how uh, Cuban Americans and Cubans view their relationship to that era, the pre-Castro era, now the post-Castro era, and the relationship with the United States, my goodness. I mean, we're living in the middle of, of historical history. shifts. It's taking place right now. And based on our experience, not only in Miami, but in our investigations and research in Cuba, now we can take that expertise and share with Smithsonian and share nationally. What's next for History Miami as you, as you look into the future? Photography. Yeah, we have over a million photographs in our collection, existing collection, documentary photography. We have a, a collection of uh, two major newspapers in South Florida, the Miami Herald and the Miami News. And years ago, we acquired all their film negatives. We got acquired a large collection last year from a photojournalist that had been shooting Miami for 40 years, documenting South Florida. And then we have a street photography festival every year. Now we, we were partner with someone that was doing it in Wynwood for the past three years. So the past two years now, it's in our museum. It's a natural partnership. We have a major international competition, a local competition, and we have four days of panel discussions and seminars and workshops. And as far as collections, we talked about photography. We just need to keep up with the times. Right. One of the issues that we're trying to address, we have a homeless issue in Miami, not unlike a lot of cities. So one of the things I've started is an initiative to collect homeless signs. I don't know if anybody's ever really focused on those homeless signs. Those signs are always very well written. They very quickly, boldly put out the message. And some use a sense of humor. Uh, we'd love to resolve the issues of homelessness, but I don't see it going away right away. Miami's made great efforts to improve. Uh, they spend in excess of $40 million annually on homeless issues. Uh, never mind all the nonprofit organizations that support. This is just the county government. So this is a big issue. So this is like one of the areas out of many areas that we should be taking a look at. Uh, we're also, with the death of Castro, George is a great photographer, went out and took photographs in a little Havana this week. We were out there on yeah. the field. We were fortunate to live in Miami when this great event happened, historic event uh, for the Cuban people. So we were out there on Saturday morning uh, documenting, collecting signs, collecting flags, uh, t-shirts with you know 
messages on them, mm -hmm. and we're going to go back and do it whenever there's a march or another protest. So we're on the ground collecting, mm -hmm. you know, while history's being made. And they're voluntarily provided to you. They are they yes. are donated as the works of these people, with full context. So you're you're exactly. talking about a respectful interaction and telling them we respect your story and we think it's important enough to be in a history museum. Such a living history example mm -hmm. of how a history museum can remain very contemporary. George Zamanillo, Stuart Chase, thank you so thank much you. Thank you. for Our pleasure describing this work and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.